tell us a little bit about your background working with neuro and gender diverse children and teens. So my name is Finn Gratton, they, them pronouns. I'm a psychotherapist, so LMFT, LPCC. And I work with kids to adults who are on the gender spectrum and also on the neurodiversity spectrum. And, um, and um, I also work a lot with trauma, which fits into those pieces a lot. There's a lot of trauma um, experienced by those two populations. And I think I've been working with gender expensive transgender folks since I, well, like the last 10 years, since I started practicing really. Uh, uh, same with autism spectrum. In your experience, does neurodiversity in general and autism specifically somehow correlate with gender diversity? There's been a lot of reports. People said, oh, I'm seeing a lot of, like, seems like autistic people in my practice or I'll be in consulting groups and somebody will go through a case and this will be a confusing case and I'll say, they sound like they might be on the spectrum. And it's, um, as anybody who is in this community starts to pick out, there's, there's a lot more, there's, it seems like be a high, much higher percentage. It's only in the last year that I've seen a little bit better um, studies and we still have a long, long way to go. Uh, most of the studies before were super, super small, you know, 12 people, 15 people. Uh, last year, Boston Children's Hospital had a study, had like 39 people in it, still super small. And of those, 23%, so I think nine, um, were autism spectrum. So that's a super small study. So is it 23? Is it 10? Is it, you don't know. What was interesting about it was only two of them were identified as autistic before they started accessing services for gender care. Um, then either their first therapist before they sent them over to Boston Children's or Boston Children's in its short little study of this, um, doing the Asperger's quotient um, survey, uh, found that nine of them qualified as, as Asperger's. So that means gender people are going to be catching lots of autistic kids um, and adults who were never diagnosed. Because those kids were probably, most of them would still never be diagnosed. They were average age was almost 16. The next study came out right after that and it was New York University, much bigger, like 403, um, a lot more assigned male at birth. And they were all people who had been identified as autistic and that that, that um, hospital was working with because of that. And they just used the, the big survey that has, I don't know, hundreds of questions. And one question was, do you wish you were the opposite sex? Which is not a diagnostic survey of gender diversity. You know, it may be, maybe it might catch half of them. And 5% of the autistic people were identified as transgender, which is much higher than the national prevalence. And then if you add in all the ones who would say, I am the sex I am, or I am somewhere in that great, you know, variance in between wish I was the opposite sex, I expect that would be higher. So that's, that's what we've got for actual survey results. I know, and it matches what we're saying anecdotally. Um, Adult-wise, a young adult, uh, somebody was doing their master's thesis on autistic people's experiences with social, social communication classes. And they just put in the beginning of it a little line instead of putting male female for their demographic they put gender and probably about 15 percent in my memory identified something other than male or female and they were very specific they knew all the words and these were more young adults and older adults um, they were all over 18 but 15 percent of them were in that what are some of the theories as to why there seems to be a correlation between the two a lot of people have this question like how come, how come the correlation? You know, we have these little scientific minds and we want to know why, you know? Um, and I, I know my mind works that way too. However, we really, really don't know. Uh, and any studies or research is really in infancy about that. 
Um, and I'm afraid there's a lot of bias. There's a lot of bias in the autistic research that's based upon find a cure. There's something wrong with this. What's going wrong in this brain? And that scares me. It's like, it's the old style. What's going wrong in this brain that this person would be trans? What's going wrong in this brain that this person is autistic? Um, it's kind of interesting for sure. And I'd kind of be interested in reading the research, but the, honestly, I'm much more interested in the people and just that this is. And I wish, just like much research, I wish more research was being spent on. So what do we do? Because there's a lot of them. So that's where I land. What do we do now? Does neurodiversity interfere with someone's ability to accurately assess their own sense of gender? My first answer would be just no. Um, what is a challenge is the neurotypical neurodivergent interface. So there can be a communication challenge between a neurotypical and a neurodivergent person so that they aren't able to, on both sides, really understand the other person's, um, how they're communicating about their thinking or experience process. So in that case, I could say it might take me a little bit longer because even though I'm a neurodivergent person, I identify as autistic, it's a very heterogeneous crew and they think really differently from me as well as differently from other people. And I have to kind of figure out how not so much are they thinking correct, you know, about themselves, but do I understand their words right? Am I trying to put some words in their mouths to make it make sense to me? So that takes a little slowing down and learn and learning what they mean. And also as a um, neurodivergent person, I know this is true and for my clients it's true. Um, there's so much experience of people uh, not getting your experience and having to emulate other people's behaviors and communication to, to just operate in the neurotypical world that they may present themselves as something a little bit different from how they feel because they're afraid they won't be taken seriously. So if they have kind of a vague, a vague feeling like, I know I'm not a man, but I'm not sure about woman, but I, I'm afraid people won't take me seriously unless I say I'm a girl, then I have to kind of help that be okay. Um, and, and put out that I know that we do this as neurodivergent people to, because people don't take us seriously. Um, so that's, that's a stumbling block there. I think another experience that people will bring up is that gender or so many things, sexuality, feelings are a body-based experience and uh, autistic people have a harder time uh, maybe accessing their body's sensations in a way that doesn't overwhelm them or they haven't shut down. So they may have a little bit of difficulty accessing the body sense. It doesn't not a genitalia sense. It's just a, like a felt sense of who you are. Um, and that because they may not be coming from there and coming from a place that's a place that they hold as them, it's just not the way neurotypical will pe people will do it their communication about their own experience of gender may not be like how somebody who's neurotypical would say it. Uh, it may be a little less body-based and they might want to get a little bit more body sense and need some like navigation in there to be able to do that without it being overwhelming. I think they know who they are. I haven't had, you know, any more than any other population had that um, from, from, non-binary to clearly male, female. And I just want to help them be able to find, lang you know, be able to understand their language. And then if they need to, for the other people to interface with them, kind of help them be able to navigate that, whether I'm helping them do it with their parents or whether they're getting some of the ways to play this game. I generally don't like to teach people, this is the way you play the game. Like that's like teaching trans people. This is how you play the cis game and that feels so wrong, but there's sometimes for safety, you need it just as you do with trans things. Um, so 
that's when I jump in on that and say, we got to figure out there's this interface problem. It's not just you, it's them. They're not figuring out how to listen and think your way. Yeah. What are some things you try to convey to your neuro and gender diverse patients as you work with them? You're totally okay as you are. Same thing you're conveying to your trans um, body. There's why, why um, trans people who provide services to trans folks are just perfect for working with neurodivergent folks is that, is that we know you've been living with the experience of you're not okay, even before, even before words. You know, your internal experience did not match how people were meeting you. And I am recognizing that that's true for you, not just in trans, but also in that you weren't met or mirrored, even when people tried to, because they weren't getting that you were thinking in a different way and experiencing the world in a different way. And I'm getting that, and now I want to know more from you about how you experience the world. Some come in, they already know. I'm autistic, you know, I'm Asperger's, I'm, some don't know at all. So those are, it's two different um, groups, really. Um, with, if I'm conveying about gender, one of the first things that is good for them to know often is that there's an awful lot of folks like them in the um, trans uh, non-binary community. Um, and that it's, a, it's one of the more welcoming communities just because it's such a parallel experience of being marginalized, for being told for so many, so much, to be expected from birth, really, to be performing in a identity that's, that's not your core identity. So that's a good thing for them to know. This can be a good place for you. You may find other people that are just good buddies here. Um, I, um, they often don't have a really good broad understanding without judgment and without imperative to fix themselves of what it is to be neurodiversion, what it is in the community. Um, because that's a lot focused in schools on the social communication, um, they, they may be missing that there's an executive functioning component. Um, and what that does, how that affects them and how they can work with them. So I'm just helping them identify things and communicate with those parents about the things, the things that the parents may be thinking they're being entitled or they're being resistant or lazy or something. So I help reframe a lot of those experiences. Um, I, I work with them a lot about, quote, special interests, you know, that this is, that this is a, a way that you can connect. Um, and um, so we'll do that. I make it okay for them to do the things they do. And I'm really curious, like the things they have to do with their hands and their bodies when they're in the office. You know, I kind of see my office, which I may walk around and show you. There's, there's a lot of possibilities for how you're gonna sit and move and do things with your hands and bodies. Um, and I, so one of the key ideas is you've been, gi you've been given a, a, um, a script that's really um, the wrong script for you. And we're gonna try to change that some. You do these things, whatever it is, the, that somebody considers problematical, and I will help them identify what about they're doing is, what, is, what does that help with? Does it soothe? Does it help them organize? Does it you know, help them get a little buffer between things? What does it do for them? And then work from there so that they start seeing their own, how much they've done in their lives to support themselves. Because the story is usually different is how many ways they don't do things right. Um, like if some kid will throw themselves on the floor when they're about to have to go, you know, to, to somewhere, um, I will ask more like, what's good about the floor? You know? And I'm like, well, you know, like, it's not, it's often not just resistance, like, oh, I can relax, you know, I can like, it feels solid and everything feels like it's going crazy. Then when I'm on the floor, it's better. 
And then we might do one like, you're in this tiny hallway and a bunch of people are trying to go through. Can you throw yourself on the floor like a little bit before that? Or um, So um, I think I, the biggest thing I do is try to take away the shame and try to help them understand and then try to connect them with um, the community of older people, at least their writings, about um, their lives and how, how they've done this over time into their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. Yeah, but this is a common thing. So you're gonna find some buddies in this world. Um, and that um, being neurodivergent, being autistic does not you know, mean that you're not trans in the right way. Um, that to affirm their experience and that their experience in the trans community too. And if they're feeling like people aren't getting them in this support group, um, that that's because that support group needs a little education around neurodiversity and that we'll do that. Um, that's, that's our job. What are some things you try to convey to the parents of neuro and gender diverse patients? As you know, parents are gonna be all over the map about this just the way they are all over the map about um, their kids' tr trans identities. I start to, I tell them that what they're gonna find on the internet about autism is going to not be very helpful and is probably going to hurt them. Just as if they just, just Googled trans um, or trans youth. And I direct them to um, specific people and sites to learn about neurodiversity. And I mean, I direct them to this. Um, it's called The Real Experts. Uh, readings for parents of autistic children. It's written by autistic adults. Um, and to sites like this, Nick Walker's site, um, where he's got a, a pretty recent video and lots of connections. Um, and similar, and I'll explain, I, I'm often the first person to educate about autism spectrum. Um, and to educate them about is more than the social things. It's, um, it includes um, a lot of sensory issues. Often when parents start to get both the internal and the external sensory issues, um, they start to understand the things about eating and uh, that are a problem. And I alert them to problems that might arise. Many times I've got sh kids who are super thin because they can't eat enough. They don't talk like normal, like typical anorexic people because it's not about body image, but nevertheless, they are becoming malnourished. And we have to try to figure that out without making anybody wrong. Because neurodivergent people are neurodivergent, they're not going to do gender the way typical people will. So there may be some like, well, they're not dressing female. Like, no, they have a lot more freedom in their head about how they're going to do this. Um, that's, and so you just need to, to accept that, you know, you can, they're, they're not going to be typical in the social presentation of things. Um, that doesn't mean they're not the gender they identify as. So that's how I talk about it with, uh, particularly around gender. And many times it quickly goes away from gender. They're kind of okay about gender and then like, oh God, now help me with these, all these problems we were having with sleeping and eating and sensitivities and um, how do we navigate these that are the real, because those are often much more daily and challenging things than the trans identity thing. Um, and sometimes there's just a challenge. The parents don't want to accept that. They think I'm seeing autistic and everything, you know. Uh, you know, and I just try to go through the pieces, executive functioning, social things, sensory things, and some special interests and the difference between assigned female birth, assigned male at birth, how many people are not diagnosed and the history of how that happened. Uh, fortunately, like so Stephen Silverman's Neurotribes came out and there's that. Fortunately, it's in Spanish now. So if I have some monolingual primarily that they can get that in Spanish. So um, that's, that's the work. The other piece I have to mention is oftentimes the two parents will be in different places if there's two parents um, if, or there could be four parents, but they, they'll be in different places 
Uh, and one may be all like, I thought there was something and I've been saying this and they're saying, no, we, you know, they, they, they um, don't want to accept that autistic identity. Um, and that becomes a real problem for the child as well, because they're, they're, they're feeling that, that um, creep of the stigma that moves through the parent, like this is a bad thing to have, and then that gets into the kid too. And often there's a parent who's also on the spectrum who may be the more resistant to the thing. And the other parent is going, see, I told you, you too. Yeah. What would you want any providers viewing this program to take away and apply to their own practice? Okay. So key things I would like providers to know is that you have, if you're seeing trans people, you're seeing neurodivergent people. You just are. If it's 10% or 15%, you just are. Um, and you may be missing some of them. And that may explain why some things are being more challenging for them. Um, so uh, just study more, learn more about what, nerd, what that can look like. Because we, all of us, the world, got a very poor picture of what an autistic person looks like. We see a little professor white guy. Um, and that's not what it looks like. It's every race, every gender, and um, presentations that look a lot like me. You know, I am neurodivergent. I am also older and have figured out how to do some things. Um, and so that's, that's a really big thing to know is because you've got them and they are afraid to share those things things with you and it, which in, will include some gender related things like I'm not going to share something that's kind of weird about my gender or the way I think about sexuality or things like that because I'm afraid you will not care about me as a person I know you care about me as a trans person and I'm afraid you might even stop some things or tell my parents you know and then they'll stop this trans thing you know my my transition or whatever I'm doing so that creates tremendous, that shame and protection creates tremendous anxiety and difficulty working in the office. Um, another thing I would like uh, providers to know if they're not neurodivergent, even if they are, is it's a cultural diversity issue and just as you need to, do, need to learn if you're cisgender, what the experience of a trans person is, as a neurotypical person, you need to really put yourself in that experience. Read as much as you can of first person experiences of, of being autistic or otherwise neurodivergent and feel what that would be like. Play that out, how that would be like if you went into a therapist's office, if you tried to go to the doctor, how, you know, tried to, you know, be sent to a support group, things like that. Just feel it out like bit by bit and keep on putting yourself in each of these different like people you read through. Watch their videos. You're gonna like go to YouTube and watch videos of neurodivergent folks going, this is my experience, and then try to put yourself in that, in that sensory experience, in that, you know, ostracization, all those, um, in that mind that can't make the words come out in time to do it. Um, and that would be super helpful. What are some concrete ways to make the physical space of your office more comfortable for neurodiverse youth? Um, once you do that, you'll find you'll change some things in your office, in your intakes. Um, so in your, on your website, if you have a website, um, you need to be accessible in ways other than just voice. I couldn't talk to people on the phone. I had to train myself on people's answering machines in the 80s, you know? And then I moved up to actually calling them. Um, so, and you're talking with teenagers, young adults who, who, are, who have the out of texting, so they're not even trying, you know, they're, they're not working that one as much. You need to be accessible in other ways and not make that something they can't do. Even in the office, you need to make it okay to not speak. Um, you know, well, um, to go and to have no issue about that. Like, I have some whiteboards, I have paper, and we can type in the computer and do text to speech. We can have a sign if you have that thing, because usually it's an anxiety thing when, when it 
start shutting down. If it starts to shut down, one, we don't want to get you that anxious, so I'm learning that. But if that happens, then um, we'll have a sign and we'll, we'll take, we'll switch to something that works. Um, and so that they know you're taking, you're being an ally, you're taking, you're making an effort. Um, I always, um, hold on, I always make it um, a lot of opportunity for people to move in different ways in my office. So, and to have things to do with their hands and their bodies, and that's all fine. And part of that means you don't sit perfectly still and like wait for them. You kind of, you got to like sit, model that that's okay. That you might get up and move around when you get up, you know, you know, worked up about something. Um, I'll show you, I'll walk around and show you a bit of things here. Um, so, there he is. There is the land of everything I piled up here. Tell me if you can see. I have one client who just did their whole session balancing on the ball. They, um, I have a gazillion of uh, like fidget toys. They are packets of them everywhere. Land of fidget toys. Um, autistic people are not the only ones who are gonna love fidget toys. <laughs> but, uh, so nobody complains. Um, I have sandbags. Um, I use the sandbags. I'm a somatic therapist, but I don't think you have to be a somatic therapist to have a weighted blanket or some sandbags and things when pe things get a little too uh, for people. I'll just say, you know, I've got these sandbags. You can put them on your feet off and they kind of help or put them wherever you want. Um, have this weighted blanket. It might not be the right texture for you. Tell me if it's a bad texture. So you're already showing you understand something about like the touch sensitivity. Um, and they may not, and, and they may work for you and they may not. Some people like really, so it's not like you're a failure if it doesn't, but but being being autistic being neurodivergent you gotta experiment a lot with trying to make yourself comfortable so i'm just giving you a lot of things to experiment with we'll find what works and doesn't um i asked them about sitting and i have a rolling rolling chair so i will i will get the distance that feels right for them um, and that feels like they're being met some about that um and um they're swivelly chairs, all the chairs. They can sit still on the sofa, but that chair, that chair swivels, this chair swivels. Some need to keep drawing on a big pad. Small ones sometimes are a problem. I'll have big ones or small ones if they want. Some with more, more like friction because that feels better for drawing. I was like, if that, and some don't look at me, just draw the whole, you know, time they're doing it. it just making that all fine. And then um, around the gender stuff, often, with tr often there's something to consider around um, blood draws or shots or things like that. So I spend a while on those things. Um, many times that's a real challenge and um, that's kind of longer discussion, but just to, just to present like, you're gonna do this thing and it's, this is gonna happen. A lot of people go no big deal, but you know, that might be a deal for you and let's figure out how we can do it knowing what you figured out already about your body that you know that how you manage things like that and see if I've got some other tips from other people around that um, um, I tell them that um, that people on the spectrum react much more strongly their bodies their heart rates their their stress responses are much much stronger than your typical people and so it would be norm, normal for them it would make sense for them to have a really big reaction and i direct them it's on my website but i direct them to um the autism and health um survey where it will print out in response to a bunch of questions uh, interface report that you can give a doctor and they it gives them a sense of what make what's going to make that work better everything from procedures to instructions and things that's a big long answer to your short question what are some of your other thoughts about meeting the needs of neuro and gender diverse patients these kids are getting the double whammy in stigma and minority stress and in addition they have 
sensory and executive functioning stressors that that are very difficult physically um, and lead to a, a, a pretty high stress response in their body and often a lot of shame. So most of these kids I see are really having a rough time. So they will be different in some of your more neurotypical trans kids who are well supportive, like it, it feels like this is kind of happy work, you know? There, this is, this is, these could suffer. They tend to be more suicidal. There's a five to nine times higher suicide rate for Asperger's and there's nine times higher for, you know, trans people. You don't add them, you multiply. The, you're, if you're working with these people, you're, you're often thinking uh, hospitalization, but hospitalization is particularly hard for autistic trans people. It's hard as trans, you're misgendered all the time. And when you're autistic, they're not gonna feed you the right thing and they're gonna make you wrong for it and you can't eat it. And, um, and every, all your behaviors are considered, they, they don't get it. So that often makes kids worse. So you're, you're having to figure out, what do I do with this kid? Another kid I might try to hospitalize, but this one, I, I can't figure out how to do that. Um, you're having to do a lot with parents and try to get other team members on who might be seeing them in a way that's not being very supportive. So this is, this is extra work and these kids will weigh on you a bit more for how you wish you could do more. Um, so it's like the warning on, you know, warning label thing. Um, God, they need you, you know? Um, and um, it's gonna get to your heart. So the other piece is kind of heart thing. I'm a somatic psychotherapist. Um, and that's made sense to me as a neurodivergent person because I'm extremely sensitive. A lot of people think autistic folks are not that sensitive um, in emotions. They're extremely sensitive and extremely empathic. They may not figure the cognitive way, like because that person said that, then that makes me think they might feel that. That they might not get. They get that you're hurting. They get the, um, they feel things super. So it may sound like woo, but one of the biggest things about being a semiotic therapist is if you're, and I, I've been trained to do touch work, so there's touch piece too, but even not, you're, what you've got to set first is your own body. So one, you've got to settle that, and then you've also got to extend. It's like mindfulness work, you may, you're going to extend and receive from them who they are receive it into your body and extend out to them from your heart and from your solid ground, an acceptance, a welcome, a curiosity, a love for them. And I do believe that does a good piece of the work because I think they really are very, you know, sensitive to that presence. We all are. We, meaning everybody in the whole world of neurodiversity, which is everybody, we all are. They don't have, they're not living in the social nuance thing, so they're having to use this other one. I had this experience, and, many, and I've had many people report this, of making better connection with like foreigners than with people of the culture you live in, because the foreigners are not living, are not operating in the, the social nuance thing. They're having to connect from a different place and usually a deeper place because um, that's what's available. And I, in the same token, kind of use that one. Imagine if you're neurotypical connecting with someone who barely speaks your language. And so you're going to connect from not just face, because that might be wrong, but from here and how that affects them. And that I think is the is so so key to any kind of cultural diversity work. In this case, working with people who whose social, um, uh, you know, reading of the nonverbal cues or whatever may be different from yours. Hi, Carlos here. To keep the conversation going, make sure you join the Gender Spectrum Lounge 
at genderspectrum.org slash lounge. We hope to see you there.